Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Welcome to our program today entitled, How Nonprofits Can Raise Money and Awareness Through Campaigns Without Raising Legal Risk. My name is Jeff Tenenbaum. I'm the chair of the nonprofit organization's practice here at the Venable Law Firm. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, a really good crowd here in person in our uh, D.C. offices uh, for lunch here today uh, and now our seminar. And we have a, a really strong group of uh, about a couple hundred folks across the country uh, who are dialed in for our webinar here today. Uh, we're particularly gratified in, uh, in August to have such a great turnout, not typical in, uh, in Washington as far as uh, seminars go, especially nonprofit legal seminars. Uh, but we're, we're very happy about that. Uh, as many of you know, because many of you are uh, repeat uh, attendees, this is part of our monthly series of uh, seminars and webinars that we do on nonprofit legal topics. Uh, very pleased that so many of you uh, keep coming back uh, and keep dialing in uh, to, to, to listen to our, our series every month. A little preview of our upcoming programs. Preview of our upcoming programs next month on September 13th. Uh, we're going to be doing a program entitled Litigation Basics for Nonprofits, What to Do When a Complaint or Subpoena is Served, and Other Tips and Strategies. Uh, with that pr program is also going to cover governmental investigations as well. Very interesting program that I think you'll really enjoy. A couple of our uh, star litigators who do a lot of work with our nonprofit clients uh, will uh, make it a very approachable and understandable uh, topic that I think you'll, you'll take a lot away from. And then on October 16th, uh, our topic is entitled Pouring Over Your Foundation, Making Sure Your Nonprofit's Officers and Directors Insurance Coverage Matches Your Expectations. Uh, that program is going to be led by uh, one of my um, uh, colleagues uh, who works with us very frequently in reviewing uh, insurance uh, policies and coverage matters for nonprofits, has really become a, a true expert in this area. Uh, he's developed extensive experience in helping to counsel and guide nonprofits, not only in helping make sure that their uh, insurance policies, and in this case directors and officers liability insurance, is appropriate for their legal risks, uh, but also helping to ensure that, that coverage is secured when, when claims are filed. I think it will be a, a very interesting program that I encourage you to attend. <clears throat> Today's program um, covers a topic uh, that uh, literally not a day goes by that we're not counseling our clients on. Um, obviously, uh, this topic is, is going to be more applicable to 501c3s than it is going to be to 501c4s or 6s. Um, there's a, a broad array of folks represented here in the room and on the telephone, but of course even a lot of the 501c6 trade and professional associations represented have related 501c3 foundations. Uh, the process of 501c3s uh, raising funds in various uh, ways raises a whole host of fairly complicated legal and tax and regulatory risks and concerns and, and pitfalls that you need to be aware of, you need to comply with, affirmative obligations um, that you have to comply with, things that can happen if you don't cover your risk and, and, and manage your risk appropriately. And it's really a combination of a variety of different uh, areas of law that come into play here, both federal and state, um, and that overlap each other very much. Uh, and I think that uh, that's why our speakers today, uh, Melissa Steinman and Crystal and Lowson, uh, who are both part of our regulatory practice, who both work very regularly with our nonprofits, but really both approach this topic from a different perspective. Um, and we're pleased to be able to kind of put the two of them together. I think, as you'll see through the presentation today, each of their specialty areas are really going to complement each other. They're, they're very distinct and different, but they also overlap very much. And one of the things that you're going to need to do to successfully get a handle on, on the legal issues in this area is to be able to kind of combine the two of them uh, together. Uh, Melissa Steinman, to my immediate right, uh, practices primarily in the areas of advertising and marketing, antitrust, trade regulation, consumer protection, and general commercial law. Um, she's represented clients in both private and governmental litigation in these areas with experience handling both class action and Lanham Act matters as well as federal and state governmental investigation. She's the author of The Guide to Federal and State Regulation of Advertising. Uh, she's also developed a unique specialty in consumer promotions law with experience in federal and state laws applicable to promotional tools such as gift cards, rebates, free gifts, and rewards programs. In particular, uh, Melissa has an unusual depth of knowledge with prize promotions and Internet gaming, combining an understanding of the law of promotional contests, electronic media, and federal and state regulatory law. And as you can imagine, just from the topic of today's program, uh, these are issues that are going to be very relevant to today's discussion. Uh, Crystal and Lowson, to my far right, uh, is a key member of our nonprofit group here at Venable based in our D.C. office as well. Crystal has been with us uh, about three years now and is 
uh, started out as a summer associate uh, with our group and, and has worked with us ever since, has become an absolutely integral uh, member of our group, kind of covering the typical wide array of legal issues that we deal with in representing nonprofit organizations. Uh, but she's really developed kind of a subspecialty in the area of uh, charitable solicitations and fundraising related legal and regulatory and tax issues. Um, and of course, those are the issues that she's going to be focused on here today. She's also done quite a bit of speaking and writing on the topic, and uh, you'll have the benefit of hearing from her today. Some, a few logistical matters before we get started. Uh, first off, this program is being recorded. Um, uh, the recordings, by the way, of all of our uh, nonprofit legal seminars dating back about a year and a half now can be found on our website at venable.com slash nonprofit slash recordings. That link will be found on the last slide of today's PowerPoint presentation. Uh, for those of you who are in the room, you have a printed handout book that has a copy of the PowerPoint slides as well as a number of articles that we've written in the past on uh, related topics. Uh, hopefully that will be of help to you. For those of you on the uh, on the webinar, uh, the email that was sent out to you yesterday, the confirmation email, has a link where you can uh, uh, click and download and view the PowerPoint slides. And then tomorrow, all of you, both in the, in the room and on the phone, uh, will get an email um, that contains a link to the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, all of the uh, related articles, as well as a recording of the program. Feel free to share that with colleagues or others who might have an interest in the topic. Uh, we do want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the program today. For those of you in the room, raise your hands, and I'll call on you at the appropriate time. Just be patient sometimes. If our speakers are in the middle of a train of thought, I might let them finish before we answer the question. Um, and for those of you on the telephone and on the webinar, uh, pose your questions using the chat feature. I'll be manning the uh, uh, chat feature on the laptop at the front of the room, and we'll pose questions to our speakers at the appropriate time. And don't worry, our speakers will repeat the questions that are posed here in the room so everyone on the telephone can hear them. Uh, with that, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Crystalline to get us started. Crystalline. Thank you very much, Jeff, and thank you all for being here. Let me just make sure everyone can hear me, right? Okay. Well, I wanted to start off today um, talking about something I've heard a lot about in the nonprofit community, and I'm thinking you may all have as well, and that's donor fatigue. How many of you have heard that phrase going around as a current phenomenon? And I think it's actually true. And I was, I was thinking about a day um, that I experienced a couple of weeks ago that I don't think is atypical. Um, I woke up in the morning and I was driving to work, and on the radio I was listening to the radio host that I hear every day talk about a concert that was coming up that was going to be benefiting a food pantry, which sounded nice. And then I got um, to Starbucks where I get my coffee every morning, and I saw a bunch of wristbands that you could buy to support um, jobs for Americans. And I didn't buy one today, but you know, got my coffee, and I noticed it. And then I got to work, and in my inbox, which was flooded by 9 a.m., as I'm sure yours are as well, I saw two uh, specific emails. One was from one of our colleagues who was doing a personal pitch um, to try to help raise funds to help an Olympian get to the Olympics, um, and he's actually competing now. And so he was trying to do a personal solicitation. And there was also another um, group that I'm on the listserv of that was doing um, a campaign to buy a new van. So I, I saw both of those items as well. And I was thinking that's... That's before even 10 a.m., and I've seen all of these different solicitations. And it's not that I don't support each and every one of those causes, not that I don't feel that it's a good cause, but you're just bombarded, and donors don't know that where to give to or if they want to give it all, and it's kind of just a bunch of noise um, in, in the current state. So what we're going to try to do today is to talk about some different types of campaigns and the legal risks and regulations that go along with those campaigns so you guys can start thinking about ways to raise money for your nonprofits and your associations that will really rise above this noise and, and help you give an element that might have that special pitch to the person that you're, you're trying to get to really pay attention to your cause. And while you're doing that, we want to make sure that you're not raising any red flags of, of regulators or um, triggering any laws that you're, you're not anticipating. So that, that's the basic um, topic of today's presentation. And in going through, we'll, we'll cover a multi multitude of areas. We'll try to hit these all in the hour and a half and, and save time for questions. But we'll be talking about the Charitable Solicitation Requirements Overview. You guys all probably know these basics, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page going forward. Then we'll talk about a regulatory update, about a current ongoing investigation and the possibility of others. We'll talk about the social media implications of charitable fundraising. Because really, if you're, how many of you are online? How many of your charities are, are online in some form? That's good, because if you're just sending paper in the mail, you're probably not doing your job anymore. So we're going to talk about when you are online doing charitable fundraising, what types of things you need to think about. 
We'll talk about um, raffles and sweepstakes, which are very effective ways to raise money. We'll talk about promotion through social media, so the, the raffles and the sweepstakes and the, the different areas of Melissa's specialty um, online. We'll talk about mobile giving, text-to-give campaigns, as well as auctions. And then we'll do, of course, a hypothetical example to, to talk about the real-world implications of this. And then we didn't have room on this slide, but not to worry. Those of you who want to talk about federal tax, we will be doing that at the end. We'll make sure to cover it, so don't worry about that. Okay, starting off, the basic state of charitable solicitation regulation. About 40 states have a charitable solicitation statute, and these usually cover three different areas of persons. Um, the first are the charitable organizations. These are 501c3s typically, but they could do other, cover other um, different forms of organizations, the C6s and the C4s, because the definition is usually a, a charitable cause, a, a charity or a charitable cause. So it's broader than just the C3s. The professional solicitors, these are the firms or individuals that you hire to help you design your campaigns or conduct the campaigns. And then the commercial co-ventures, the for-profit entities who are running the, the bracelet sales, for example. Um, and we'll, we'll cover those campaigns pretty in depth. So starting off with the charitable organizations, these are probably uh, where most of you are, are coming from today. Um, and there's about 40 states that require registration for charities that are conducting solicitations. Now solicitation is the, the applicable triggering word, and that's defined pretty broadly. Usually it actually says in the statute, by any means, which includes you know, telephone, mail, email, social media. It's designed to be as broad as possible so that the, the states can cover all of this activity. And it also includes grant solicitation sometimes. It's a state-by-state -state definition, but certain states do specifically say grant solicitations, government grants, and corporate grants um, require you to register if you're doing that sort of solicitation in the state. There are some exemptions, typically. Uh, religious organizations or religiously affiliated organizations are sometimes exempted. Organizations that don't raise above a certain amount, this is usually a relatively low amount. Um, it's, it seems attractive, but when we start talking about it with our clients, it's usually beyond what, the, what they're raising. Most states say that if you raise, for example, more than $25,000, you're, you're required to register. And that $25,000 most of the time is nationwide in all forms of solicitation, so usually you're, you're above that level. Um, but for example, New York does say solicitations within the state, so that's 25,000 within New York, but most states are nationwide. Um, hospitals are typically exempted. Organizations soliciting only their membership, and if your member is a bona fide member, they have rights and obligations in the organization, not just they sent you money and you put them on a mailing list and now they're your member. Can't get around it that way. Um, and then named individuals, for example, if, if somebody has a disease and their family hosts an event, usually that is not covered um, under the charitable solicita solicitation statutes. So the regulators have a little bit of compassion. Um, and then, as you can see, this is pretty broad and it catches a lot of uh, different activities. And we typically find that our nonprofits in this day and age are soliciting in, in all states, whether they're sending emails, they're calling, they're putting you on a mailing list for their newsletter, which contains the solicitation. So it's, it's usually the case that you would be required to register in 40 states if you're a charity conducting solicitation. And so the regulators got together and tried to make this a little bit easier. There is a uniform uh, registration statement, and it's supposed to be a common form that you can submit to all the different states. How many of you have, have registered with the URS? Uh, you can probably attest that it's not actually uniform. <laughs> Every state wants it a little bit different. They want to see your, your determination letter, for example, or your most recently filed 990, or they have supplemental questions. So at least you'll have a base, but it, it is definitely a, quite an endeavor to go through the process of registration. But on the other hand, it is required. Um, and if you are triggering the solicitation statute, these are the typical requirements, registration and renewal, usually annually. Disclosures when soliciting, such as the name of your organization, your address, where, you can, where consumers can go to find your financial statements, and then annual reporting requirements. And a lot of times the annual reporting is tied um, either asking you to repeat numbers from your Form 990 or submitting your most recently filed Form 990. So when these um, statutes were written, almost all of them were before the age of the Internet. And they contemplated uh, solicitation as you kind of know it when you see it. It's you're sending a letter, you're holding an event in a state, seem pretty cut and dry. And with the age of the internet um, and, and people going online and raising money and becoming very effective with online solicitations, the lines became pretty blurred. When you're sitting in your office in DC, you're sending emails to a listserv of as many people as you can, you're not necessarily knowing where those emails are going. 
but you may be triggering registration requirements. So in 2001, um, the National Association of State Charity Officials, NASCO, got together in Charleston, South Carolina and tried to fix this problem. They developed what's known as the Charleston Principles. The Charleston Principles are voluntary um, in most states. They're, they're supposed to be a guideline. They have been adopted as rules in Colorado and Tennessee, but for, for most of the time it's just helpful guidelines to try to determine when you would be triggering the registration requirements. And they require um, registration or other uh, requirements in basically two broad areas. First is if you're domiciled in the state, if your principal place of business is in Washington, D.C., for example, you gotta register there, that's, that's pretty easy. Also, if you're not registered in the state, but your offline activities are sufficient to trigger the statute, then you have to register there if you're, you're sending letters, for example. Now, here's the tricky bucket. Um, if you're soliciting donations on the internet, but say you have a donate now button on your website, so you're doing passive solicitations. You're not actively triggering a certain state. The NASCO Charitable Solicitation Charleston Principles would say that you would register if you receive donations that are either substantial or repeated and ongoing. Um, substantial is, is qualitative and repeated and ongoing is frequency. So the, the principles basically state in their notes that the states can determine what is substantial and what's repeated and ongoing, but they provide a little bit of guidance in saying, for example, repeated and ongoing could be 100 donations in a year um, from that state, and substantial could be $25,000 or more, or some percentage of your donations. So those are, those are just guides, but then again, it's, no state has, has adopted a specific number for repeated and ongoing or substantial. So just something to think about. Um, so the practical effect of that is if you have a Donate Now button, you're going to be wanting to look at the list of where your donations came in from after you, you start that process to try to determine where you should be registering if you aren't already um, registered everywhere. Okay, so I, I hear that and every time I hear rules like that, it just kind of goes over my head. So I thought we could go over an example just quickly. So here's the example. A nonprofit, the Southwest Animal Charity, is headquartered in, has its principal office in Texas. It holds events in Texas. Um, and it provides funding to individuals in the United States, um, or probably since it's an animal charity, to, to grants to other organizations to, for example, have shelters throughout the United States. And the organization has a website where it solicits donations. Um, and those donations come from pretty much everywhere. And then some people, when they send a donation, they get onto a mailing list and the organization says, thank you for your donation. Oh, and here's this other campaign that we're doing that you can donate to as well. And they, they also mail outside of Texas. So where, where would they have to register? If they're not already registered everywhere, they'd start with Texas, obviously, because that's where they're located and they have events. They would send, uh, wherever they send mail or email, they're specifically targeting people in that state, they should register there. And then they should look at where the Donate Now um, receipts are coming from and register in the states in which it's substantial or repeated and ongoing. However, you're able to get the regulators to define that or you decide to define that uh, conservatively on your own. So there's a red herring in here. Um, you know, I hearkened back to law school and added something in here. Does anybody see what, what does not matter in this uh, situation? Which activity is not implicating charitable solicitation requirements? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, it's the, the giving of the grants to individuals or, or people throughout the United States. That activity you're not really needing to consider for the solicitation. The solicitation is the ask, not where the money is going. Um, the question was whether there's case law or administrative law in the states where this is tested. Um, this specific example has, I didn't, I, I made this up um, just to give us an idea. There, there have certainly been cases where organizations have not registered in a state and there's been published opinions about um, that administrative process. Usually it's not so refined. Um, usually it's this person was sending a lot of letters to people in this state. We can clearly see that they were soliciting. Um, but what I did pull this example from is uh, different presentations from state regulators who are explaining how they view the rules and from the Charleston Principles note. Yes? How would you have a group in Texas, you're located here, and you have a group in Texas that is organizing a fundraiser for your organization. You just look at them, they just on their own decided that they wanted to organize a barbecue. How does that solve 
it, the, the laws are pr written pretty broadly. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, if you have an organization that's located here in D.C., um, but another group is hosting a fundraiser for that organization in a different state, say in, in your example in Texas, would the organization in D.C. have to consider the charitable solicitation laws of Texas? And the first step is obviously to look at how they define it, because every state is a little bit different. Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall Texas's definition. But I can tell you that I have seen states in which it says where the organization is conducting solicitations or having solicitations conducted on its behalf. So I think that the, the second part of that statement would cover somebody else conducting solicitations for you. Um, and also when, when the professional uh, fundraiser statutes, which is what we're going to be talking about next, they require usually that the professional fundraiser, if they're conducting solicitations in a state, that charity has to be registered. So it's under the same principles. It's somebody else conducting solicitations on your behalf, but the charity as, as a base usually always has to be registered in that state. And the only thing I distinguish there is that if, if the entity that's doing the fundraising in Texas uh, to raise money for the charity in D.C., if the charity in D.C. has no knowledge of it, no connection, didn't give its consent, didn't license its trademark to be used as part of the promotional fundraising campaign, and it's just, you know, that group in Texas just really wants to benefit the D.C. group, does it on its own, collects funds and sends a check, in that situation I don't think the D.C. charity would have any registration obligations. Right, it's assuming you have knowledge or you've consented. The question was, if you receive a grant from an organization in another state, do you have to register in the state where the grant was received from? Um, and that would, again, you would look to the definition of what the solicitation was and what the solicitation activities were. Did the organization actively write a letter to the organization in the state saying, here's our organization, here's our proposal, would you fund us? Or was it this company just kind of heard of your organization and a check was dropped in the mail? You would, right, usually you would um, ha still have to register, but it depends, again, you'd look at the definition of solicitation to see if grants solicitation is included or excluded. I've definitely seen it where it is specifically included, but some states will say that solicitation doesn't include grants. So that, that one's kind of on the line. You'd want to check the state where the um, donation was received from to see how they define solicitation. Uh, Crystal, and we have uh, two questions from the uh, from the web web participants, and then I, we're going to have to move on because then we have so much to we have to cover. And um, so, sorry, the, we knew in advance that we weren't going to be able to, to delve into great depth on all these topics because of the way we structured this. We're covering a pretty broad array of topics, but we'll certainly be available afterward and, and any time later to answer your questions. But two uh, uh, very relevant questions. Uh, one is an issue we deal with all the time: What if you're only soliciting your members? Um, and these are, of course, bona fide members, not just a moniker you put on anyone who gives a donation. Um, uh, what are the rules regarding registration and or what are the exceptions? There are um, sometimes exceptions for when you're soliciting only your members. Um, and that means if, if the people you're soliciting in that state are only your members, and the members are defined as bona fide members, meaning that they receive rights and privileges. They can vote in the organization, um, that you have regular contact with them. They uh, participate in your activities. They're not just someone who receives mail from you at home. Um, if they are your bona fide members, several states do have exceptions for that, but not all of them. So you can't assume that you don't have to register anywhere if you're soliciting only your members. Um, but if it's only in a few states, I would, I would check the statute and spend the time, because they, a few states definitely have exceptions for that. Um, a second question says, basically, it's, uh, it's unrealistic and unaffordable for a small nonprofit that really is doing solicitations in many states to register in those states. Um, the staff is too small and the budgets can't afford it. Um, are the states really enforcing this would be one question. And then secondly, maybe Kristen, speak to the fact that uh, we've actually done a lot of research on behalf of clients to find some fairly affordable options out there in terms of companies, vendors uh, that do uh, multi-state or, or nationwide, it's not, of course not every state, um, but na nationwide registrations on behalf of charities on, on a pretty cost-efficient basis. Uh, this is something we, we realized a long time ago that we as a, as a law firm really can't do very cost-efficiently uh, on behalf of clients. So we wanted to find resources for, for our clients to 
be able to utilize. And we found some really good ones out there, which we're happy to provide. Um, and so for those of you who are going through a little bit of a panic attack saying, oh, no, we really do need to register in all these states, yes, the states do care. Yes, they do bring enforcement actions regardless of your size, and the penalties can be significant. Uh, there are options for doing it. I'm not saying it's, it, it costs you close to nothing, but there, there, it, there are cost-efficient ways to do it. Um, but actually, let, let me just, I pretty much answered the question yeah, myself. I don't but, know what the question is. <laughs> uh, but this is an issue, and we spoke to, uh, uh, to a group recently, you and I, uh, we got a question like this before, but will you cover the legal aspects of uh, crowdfunding on sites such as Kickstarter or Indiegogo and, and what sort of registration reporting requirements kick in in those situations? Sure. This person just wants me to move ahead with the presentation because we have a few slides specifically on that. So without further ado, let me just run through the rest of them and then we will get to that exact topic, which I know is the, the hot topic. Um, so we're done with Charleston principles. So um, moving on to the professional fundraiser, professional solicitors. The states uh, categorize this as a whole separate bucket. If you have someone who is being compensated to solicit on your behalf, then they will, they will have their own registration responsibilities. Um, and states actually look at, at this bucket a little bit more closely, I think, because they've had so many scandals where people are soliciting um, as, as fundraisers and keeping what the state deems to be too much of the funds, or they're saying they're soliciting for the firefighters and, and they're actually soliciting for their own pockets. Um, so this is something that's, that's closely watched and there's a lot of regulations in this area as well. Okay, so commercial co-venture regulations. This I think is, is something that I literally receive an email about every single day. It seems like it's just a field that people are finding are, is very, very successful for fundraising and therefore we're very interested in it. Um, and, and because the, the public is interested in it and charities are, the regulators are as well. Um, just a, a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that Macy's did a campaign uh, with the Nature Conservancy, and they raised $3 million in three weeks for, uh, through a commercial commenture. It was um, a Brazil campaign, and they were donating a portion of the sales and a portion of the, the shopping passes. And that, that's just incredible. It's a, a great achievement, and I think something that a lot of people would like to emulate. But commercial commenters are used by both small and large organizations, local and national. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about them. Um, there's your example. I'm using Starbucks again. You can tell where I go. Uh, Ethos Water, if you contribute five, per, five cents for each uh, bottle of the Ethos Water, we'll go to the Ethos Water um, Fund. So that's your, your typical language in a commercial co-venture. About 25 states have laws that regulate commercial co-ventures. About five of these require actual registration um, and maybe bonding by the commercial co-venture. That's the for-profit entity. The other states either require a written contract Sometimes they actually want you to file the written contract or they have mandatory provisions that must be in that contract. Um, there are advertising disclosures. And again, when you say by any means, they say by any means um, possible, it really is. You have to get those disclosures on, on whatever type of advertising you're doing. And Melissa and I have worked on several campaigns where you have to be a little bit creative. You know, you have a, a short space for the radio or the, the web advertisement, but they have to be there. So that's something to think about. And then accounting and record keeping. For example, a lot of states will say for three years all the records must be kept by the commercial co-venture and the a nonprofit. One thing just to mm -hmm. add in um, that we work a lot. Thank you. Is this thing on? Um, we work a lot with both um, for-profit and not-for-profits, and a lot of the time in thinking about particularly the agreement, um, there will be expectations on both sides as to who will take sort of the laboring oar when it comes to um, drafting the written contract um, uh, that will be compliant with the state law requirements. Um, regarding what should be in that agreement and that sort of thing. So it's very important to get those expectations clear um, as to um, who will come up. Often it's very helpful to have a form um, that will um, uh, meet all those requirements. Um, it will uh, often benefit you. Um, simply assuming, well, the for-profit is really big, um, they'll, they'll have something that will work for a commercial co-venture campaign. Um, the expectation on the other side may be, well, the not-for-profit does this all the time. You'll have a contract. So getting that out on the table um, is important, um, and uh, you know, making assum assumptions won't really benefit anybody. So. Yeah, that's a, the contract is a big piece of what we work on. Mm -hmm. and, Yes? Is there an expectation by donors, I mean, five cents for your grocery bag to go to the animal shelter, that they have a charitable deduction opportunity in any of these ventures? 
We, we always, oh, um, there, the question was whether the people who are the consumers who are buying the product have an expectation that they can take a charitable deduction for the portion of the product that they're buying. Um, and the answer or, or, to or that sometimes, to expand on your question, some people ask us, is the retailer who's collecting you know, or, or donating that five cents of every purchase to the charity, is there an expectation on their part, or are they actually taking a charitable tax deduction for their donation? Um, as far as the individuals, Usually the product won't increase in price because it's a, it, it, there's a charitable element involved, or at least we recommend that it, it does not. It should stay, you know, the hair dryer should be the same price as it was a week ago before it was pink. Um, and in that case, the, the um, consumer is still getting the benefit that they're, they're paying for. The, the hair dryer, they're not making any specific charitable donation. And the way that the IRS defines a charitable donation is that there aren't benefits received in return, or if there are benefits received in return, the, the benefits are less than the amount given, so that there's some sort of charitable element. So from a donor tax perspective, there shouldn't be any charitable deduction taken because you purchased a hair dryer that was pink, for example. Um, but we make sure in our contracts that's an important element to consider that neither side make any representations that there are charitable, there are deductions that could be taken. You generally don't want to be advising anybody else, including a consumer, on, on what they can do with their income taxes. Um, as far as the corporate side, uh, that the corporate that could be a corporate donation if if it's not the price is increased at all, increased at all because they're still receiving the same um, compensation for their product, but they're donating, say, 25% of that. So in that case, there could be a corporate deduction. Um, but again, we, we don't usually um, get into that with the, the contract. Yeah, it's, it, it, generally that corporation that's donating that, that percentage of the sale to the charity should be able, in most cases, to take a charitable tax deduction for those contributions, of course, subject to the, to the limits that are in, in federal tax law. Uh, they may, may also decide to take a business tax deduction as a marketing expense. But the important thing, if you're with the charity and if the corporation asks you something like that, you can give an answer, a general answer like that, but you should never be advising a corporation or an individual on what they can do from a tax perspective because it's very organizational and specific. Um, you can't give general guidance and certainly not tax advice, so you want to be very careful. If you're the charity and you get asked those questions, give general answers, but don't give specific tax advice. And speaking of pink branded products, it moves right into this slide. Um, we are often asked, uh, as, as the gentleman had a question about, well, what enforce I want to see what could actually happen if I disobey these laws. And a lot of times it's hard for us to come up with, there's, there's a few specific concrete examples out there, for example, the, the YoPlay um, investigation by the Georgia Attorney General. But a lot of times investigations into charitable activities are, are done discreetly because if it turns out there's nothing there, they don't want to damage the charity's good name. Um, but there has been investigations launched, and most recently the Attorney General in New York uh, launched an investigation into breast cancer charities, specifically companies and organizations that are uh, doing product sales that involve uh, pink causes. And what this uh, in entailed was questionnaires were sent to 40 charities and even more uh, for-profit companies, 130 from our count. Um, that were involved in these activities. The questionnaire sent to the for-profit company had about 19 questions, and it really went through step by step. The statute isn't that long, but they asked about every single part of it. For example, do you have a contract? Was there an accounting done in this instance? Uh, was there a maximum or minimum contribution uh, as part of the campaign? Was this disclosed? And then they also requested as a very catch-all any sort of television, print media, email, Twitter, Facebook, or in-store advertising that mentioned this campaign. So you can imagine somebody is going through the text of all of those uh, promotions and seeing what was actually told to consumers and was this followed through in the accounting and all the other things that they asked for. So New York is definitely taking a close look. We, I don't think the um, investigation has been concluded yet. We haven't received any notice that it has been. Um, but New York does issue reports a lot of times. They have their pennies for charities in your report. So I wouldn't be surprised if a report is, is shortcoming on the commercial convention aspects. And then once one report is released, it's going to be in the media, it would probably be likely that other states could uh, conduct their own investigations. So this one's specific to breast cancer, but there's so many different causes out there that we wouldn't be surprised if more states are, are doing uh, public investigations. So now looking um, with the intersection between the Internet 
in charitable solicitation. This has been described by one state regular, uh, regulator, Bob Carlson in Missouri, as one big gray area. And it really is. When you're looking at all these different types of crowdsourcing sites and, and fundraising websites, how do you discern what your registration responsibilities are with, with those sites? But on the other hand, we still have our same three buckets and we still have our same principles. So we can use those when we look at different websites. So to delve in, here's, here's the principles that I think about when I'm looking at things that look pretty innovative or I'm not really sure exactly how they fall. The first is, is there a solicitation? This, of course, can take uh, a form of social media. But here's two that I, I recently pulled out. The first is a Facebook post. For example, instead of going to see the gray, donate $10 to the Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Project. There's a solicitation. And uh, if you're on Facebook, likely all your Facebook friends are from different, all different states. So you may be receiving donations based on that solicitation in all different states, which if you're not already registered, could trigger registration requirements. And it's important to note that even if everybody who read this actually did go and, and saw the gray and didn't do any donations, the fact that you're soliciting could still um, put you within the solicitation requirements. The solicitation is the ask, not necessarily the receipt of funds. So while the receipt of funds can, can guide you, th this here is, is definitely a solicitation, no matter what happens afterwards. Also, Twitter feeds, um, another animal charity. Right now, every donation to the ASPCA will be doubled, help twice as many animals. That's a solicitation. So the second thing to think about when you're considering the social media aspect is another party receiving compensation for your solicitation. Now, this can, this can happen through, for example, Facebook status loans. You know, if you, if you loan your status, we'll, we'll give you a t-shirt or we'll enter you into a raffle. If you write about our charity on this certain day and we can really flood Facebook, that could be seen as, is that t-shirt or is that chance to win a prize compensation? Does that person now become a professional solicitor? Also, uh, retweets under the same sort of principles. And then charitable platforms or um, charitable uh, social media, and that's such as crowdrise.org or donorschoose.org. There's a bunch of different sites and they're popping up more every day, but it's basically a, a platform in which people can ask for donations or put their charity to request donations. When you're looking at the charitable platforms, some things to consider are is there compensation provided to that website for either posting about the charity or, or is there some sort of special ranking that the, the platform does to, for the charity? And who provides the content? Who writes that paragraph describing the charity? Is it the social platform or is it the charity themselves? And then where does that donation button go? Is the donation button a link to the site of the charity and then the donor is, is donating there? Or is it a um, payment system that's run through the, the social platform? So to put this into perspective, here's, here's one website I pulled. This is called Changing the Present. You can't see it from the, um, this page, the, this screenshot, but Changing the Present charges a, a fee. I think it's last time I checked, 2 to 3% of the monies received uh, by the charity for, for hosting this. They charge each of, each of the charities that amount. So they're receiving compensation. The content here is written by Changing the Present. Uh, they, they free write the content to try to make it you know, most appealing. So they're providing a service and they're receiving compensation. And then the payment is through that little cart, the green thing next to the, um, the prices. That, that amount is actually run through changing the present, I believe, it's uh, their payment system. So this could be deemed a professional fundraiser under some state statutes. In contrast, just to provide a, a little bit of uh, something to look at, this is Will Farrell's uh, CrowdRise page, and he's pretty, f pretty famous for these. He has a bunch of different pictures at the bottom which are pretty entertaining if you have time to take a look. Now this, this um, website, he's writing the content. Well, probably somebody, one of his people is writing the content. <laughs> but it's not, the, uh, it's not CrowdRise, he's providing that himself. The donate button um, goes to either Donors Choose or I think it's Amazon Payments. Um, so it's not run by CrowdRise. Um, and I'm not sure about the, the compensation that, is, that the charities have to provide. I don't believe that the charities have to pay anything for Will or an everyday person to make a CrowdRise page. So this one, you know, there, there's some elements. There is a CrowdRise, you can't see it because it's so small, but next to Will's Charitable Life in, in green or orange print it says CrowdRise Verified. So maybe that could fall on the, the side where they're 
uh, verifying the charity. CrowdRise is some, some way of providing an en endorsement of the charity, saying they looked at something. So that, that seems like a service. But the other elements would, would look like this is not a professional fundraiser. Having worked has helped set up another one of these types of organizations. You pay for the verification if you're one of these groups. Got it. So that's where they make their profit. And that's actually arguably, if we we'll talk about endorsements in a little while, that's sort of the endorsement there also and where some of the risk is. So, Thank you. So what does this mean to you as a charity? It's, it, I, I like to do it because it's kind of theoretical and I like to consider these elements, but why does this matter to you? Well, it matters because when you have to do your annual filings as a charity, you have to report the professional fundraisers that you're using a lot of times. So if you have to determine whether this is a professional fundraiser or not as, as somebody that you'll, you'll be reporting. And if they are, you'll want to make sure that in your contract, if you have a contract with a site like this, that they're handling or taking responsibility for handling their professional fundraiser charitable solicitation requirements so the charity's not somehow on the hook for missing that. So those are some of the, I'm sorry, question? Well, we'd, we'd want to take a look at the specifics. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry for getting that. So the question is, well, what about um, Living Social and other deal sites, Groupon, that run campaigns where the consumer can purchase a ticket or an item, um, and some of the money will go to the charity and some of the money will go to Living Social or Groupon? I haven't taken a, a specific lo look at those sites in particular, but the same sort of um, steps would, would apply. It's definitely a solicitation. You're saying, you know, come to this event and, and help support this uh, nonprofit. It depends on what, what is the compensation tied to. I assume that the, is the charity giving any sort of funds to Living Social or uh, Groupon for, for hosting that uh, promotion for the day? Um, also, the, the, is Groupon holding any of the money or is Living Social holding any of the money before they give it to the charity or does it go through some sort of other payment system? And then finally, to add on, on top of it, a lot of the um, kind of conduit sites are establishing their own charities. So uh, I think, I'm not sure, but I think Groupon has its own 501c3 where the money goes first to the C3 and then is distributed. And in, in that instance, the, the registration requirement is on the initial uh, 501c3. So it's a way that they're trying to fulfill the requirements without being professional fundraisers. So I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive answer, but those are some of the things that you would look at to consider. And that's actually particularly interesting in that the FTC takes a very, very broad view of when a website should be liable for claims that are made on its website, even by third parties. And while Groupon's contract, at some version of its contract, is out on the web and completely disclaims any liability for affiliates or third parties that appear on its site, the the understanding is that the FTC is taking the position that there is some liability for claims by third parties that, you know, marketers that are, are selling via its site. So be very interesting to see what happens there, um, you know, going forward in the future. But I think that, you know, taking a look at, at organizations like CrowdRise who do verify um, and, you know, what that means, because I haven't reviewed CrowdRise's um, terms and, and what they do there you know, there could be something similar that happens um, when, you know, going out in the future. It's, it's obviously, we can't opine there. It's tough to say, but, you know, these are the types of principles. The, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, I don't think we defined terms there, but um, uh, tends to take a very broad view and try to sweep everybody in under the umbrella of liability when it conducts these types of um, investigations and, and brings lawsuits like that. So. And even though uh, the Federal Trade Commission doesn't have jurisdiction over bona fide uh, nonprofit charities, um, they do uh, will fr and will frequently uh, pursue for-profits who are involved uh, in fundraising efforts. And if your nonprofit has to, happens to be linked up with that, there can be some very uh, negative uh, public relations fallout from that. And of course, state attorneys general, like the example Crystalline gave earlier, like New York State Attorney General investigating the breast 
uh, cancer charities. States attorneys general do have uh, similar uh, uh, types of regulatory authority as the FTC, and they do have jurisdiction uh, over charities. And so uh, many times you'll see state AGs pursuing charities in a way that the FTC will pursue against for-profit companies. And, and literally the, uh, the laws that, that they tend to enforce at the state level are, are often drafted very similarly, so they follow very similar principles in enforcement. All right, we're up to speed yeah, things up yeah, here, I know. Um, but the third thing to look at when you're venturing into the social media or new forms of campaigns that you're not really sure how to fit it in, is, is there a, a, premi a solicitation that the goods or the services being offered will benefit a charity? If that is the case, if you can answer yes to that, then it's probably a commercial co-venture, no matter which platform it's being advertised on. Um, this is one I pulled yesterday from Facebook. It's, it's a breast cancer watch, um, and the fine print is clearly a an ad that if you buy this watch, you'll help support a charity. And I also thought it was important um, to point this out because that's, that's pretty broad. Um, they might want to refine this statement a little bit. You don't want to say you'll help support, well, well, how much is going? A lot of these states will say you have to say on a per product basis. So you want to make sure that your, your disclosures, even on when you have a little bit of text, are clear and accurate. And then this is um, through Twitter. It's Heifer International. It's a pretty cool nonprofit that um, allows you to donate uh, money, and then they buy uh, farm animals for developing countries. They were selling a, a T-shirt, a special T-shirt. If you buy the T-shirt, it'll help Heifer. So again, that's a commercial co-venture. Even though it's a small uh, 124 character or whatever the, the limit is, that, that's a commercial co-venture solicitation. Okay, so here are some of my closing thoughts of, well, how do I deal with this gray area? This is the reality. This is what you're going to be seeing every day. Besides thinking about these principles, here are some things to keep in mind. Recognize the effect of going viral. You might have a nationwide registration. If you're not already registered and you start advertising or soliciting on Facebook, you're likely going to be triggering a nationwide registration process. And I think I would add here um, that, that the effects are unavoidable. You don't want to not use Facebook or, or not send emails to people, um, but you will have to consider your registration responsibilities. And then for every charitable solicitation partner, include some reps and warranties. I think this goes back to when you were asking about Living Social or Groupon or, or new ventures that we're not really able to say yes or no. Um, at least, the least you can do is make sure that in your contract, each party says that they've independently assessed their responsibilities and they're handling them on their own so that it doesn't you know, turn around and yes, they are a professional fundraiser, it turns out, and they didn't fulfill that responsibility. You, you want to make sure that that was clearly on their plate. And then check into the broad definition of consideration. Um, it's not just that you're paying someone a salary to call people for you. There's a lot of different forms of consideration, and regulators take a close look at that. So if somebody is receiving a benefit and you're telling them, if you advertise or you fundraise for us, we'll give you X, that, that might trigger professional fundraising responsibilities even without a professional fundraising contract. Um, and then check in with the regulator. This is just some informal advice. We do this often. Uh, the regulators are dealing with the same sorts of laws that are envisioning just a very set process of mailing letters and holding events in their state when we're so far away from that, that they're trying to fit things into these boxes as well. And a lot of times we'll call on a, a no-name basis and, and just check in, well, how do you feel about this? Of course, the advice is not binding, but it gives everybody, you know, a, a new chance to look at different innovative technologies and, and have a conversation. So you, you can often do that if you're unsure, or we can do that on your behalf as well. So now Melissa will talk a little bit about the sweet stakes and the raffles, um, and then we'll wrap up with a hypothetical. Uh, yes, some questions? Yeah, one quick question. What if I have a fundraising dinner at a trade convention? So I've got a thousand people from all over the country, all over the world. We happen to get together 400 of us and we'll start writing checks. What are the implications Where do you? Uh, yeah, yeah, let me ask a couple of questions. So the, the question is, what if we're uh, doing a fundraiser in connection with, at a trade convention? I assume you mean like a trade association convention and that's run by, say, a 501c6 trade association, and in connection with that, you're having some fundraising dinner. Well, one question is, is that for the related foundation of the trade association or for, or for some unrelated charity? For an unrelated charity. For an unrelated charity, and, and it's the 501c6 who is organizing the dinner and soliciting um, you know, people to buy tickets to come to the dinner, and then they're going to collect the proceeds and give the proceeds to an unrelated charity? No, the charity itself will be organizing the event with the blessing of the 
Okay, so the charity is organizing the event kind of under the C6's uh, auspices, uh, letting them come, come in, organize, solicit, et cetera. And, and your question is what? What are the registration requirements within the environment? For the charity that's organizing it and or for the trade association or for both? Okay. So that's after, I hope you guys all got that explanation because I'm not going to reword the question. <laughs> but I think the, the key is looking again, back to square one, is there a solicitation? Did people just end up at your dinner? I mean, they must have heard about it from somewhere. How did they hear about it? Did, were emails sent to all those different people in the different states? Or was it just when you got to your event, you had a sign that said, come to our dinner? If that's if, if the latter, if you just had a, a sign and said, come to our dinner, and you're in Missouri, for example, and that's your only solicitation, you just have to look at Missouri's laws and, and consider registration in Missouri. If, on the other hand, which is the more likely possibility, you've been advertising for weeks, putting it in your newsletter, sending it to people, advertising it on your social media, um, sending emails, that's probably triggering registration in wherever the states that people are located that received those emails or those letters. As far as the registration responsibilities of the C6, um, that is holding the event at, at their convention, are they receiving any compensation for doing that? Are they trying to uh, talk to a broader audience that, that they are in contact with and say, hey, support this charity, come to our dinner, come to our convention, and at our convention, come to this dinner. If there was a payment made from the charity to the 501c6 for doing that activity, that starts to look like a professional fundraiser, compensation to solicit on somebody's behalf. If, if on the other hand, you're doing it out of your own goodwill and in relations with the 501c3, and there's no compensation there, it's probably not um, triggering any registration, re registration responsibilities for professional fundraisers. Uh, one more question, and we got to move on. If an organization decides, look, we'll, we'll just play it safe, we'll register in all four states. Two questions. One is the downside to that strategy, and second thing would be if they hired one of these companies, say Jeff, who was alluding to before, can you give some approximation what it would cost us to register in all states? Sure. Um, the downside is, now that you're registered, you'll probably... Oh, okay, so the question is, um, <laughs> it, what are the downsides to playing it safe and registering in all 40 states that require it, whether or not you conduct solicitations there now? And as a follow-up, what are the approximate fees or what, what's that going to run you to, to do that activity? So for the first uh, question, the downsides, the downsides is once you're registered, they have your information and you're likely going to have to be doing annual reporting. So you'll have some follow up the, the plus to that is if you hire a firm, usually they will take care of that. Similar to your, for example, registered agent doing your corporate filing sum. Usually the, the company that you hire will monitor and, and make sure you're aware of your filing, annual filing responsibilities. Um, and as a plus side, if you're already registered everywhere and say you're approached by a corporation, this, this, we've had this happen several, heard of it happening several times, the corporation finds you and says, hey, in three weeks we want to run this national campaign to benefit your charity. And all of a sudden you're scrambling trying to get your registrations done. Well, if you had registered everywhere, you wouldn't have to do that. Um, firms vary uh, how much they charge. We, we can send lists you of what we found, if you'd like, um, as low as 5,000, as high as 20,000 to, to perform the service. And the unfortunate part of it is that the, the actual filling out of the forms is what takes the most time and invest, you have to invest the most resources. The filing fees are maybe a couple thousand dollars total uh, nationwide. The, the fee is in the, the filling out and making sure that you have all the pieces of paper that they need and, and you have all the, the answers so that you can receive your registration number back. Um, but feel free to email us if you'd like uh, yeah. a few of the names. And of course, don't forget, it's not, that's the registration. Then you have the annual reporting. Um, and there's, uh, there are obviously costs associated with that, not as much as the initial registration, but certainly there are costs. You can use these same firms to, to do that for you as well. But certainly there are burdens that go along with it. But the bottom line is if you're soliciting in all of these states, and it's very clear you're soliciting, um, you know, un unless you're a, a really, really tiny brand new charity that just literally can't afford to do it, and you just need to wait a year until you have some resources to be able to do it, you really do need to do it. it there's really not much choice. Uh, we're going to move on to the n next part of the presentation, but we'll save time at the end, and Melissa and I will be here um, for individual questions as well. So, Melissa? Okay. 
Now we are going to move on to some of the specific sort of techniques for fundraising. My specialty um, tends to focus in specific types of promotional techniques, advertising, marketing for both for-profits and non-profits. Um, so we can talk a little bit about each of those, and then if you have questions, of course, feel free to ask them. Um, as, uh, as things have gotten more interesting in the uh, uh, fundraising world and the promotions world, we've been talking more and more, as Crystalline mentioned, about online, social media, and the like. The rules to a large extent remain the same, um, although there are a few areas where there are specific rules that overlay, um, both uh, because you may be off operating in the nonprofits world or because you're operating in this sort of technical world of online and social media. So we'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, one technique that we've all been using for years um, is endorsements and testimonials. Um, the uh, FTC has some guidelines for, uh, for that, uh, the guides to endorsements and testimonials um, that have existed for years that they uh, recently updated. Um, the state sort of, uh, like Jeff uh, mentioned, sort of follow along when it comes to the FTC's rules here. Um, one of the reasons why is because the guides to endorsements and testimonials are just that, they're guides that are um, interpreting the very general rules um, uh, that's uh, Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act that exists that sort of just say, thou shalt not advertise deceptively. Um, the states tend to have a very similar law, and so essentially what it says is you, um, the Federal Trade Commission or the, uh, the Attorney Generals are the experts when it comes to what is deceptive or misleading advertising, um, and you'll apply that expertise when it comes to, um, say, an endorsement or a testimonial um, from uh, a celebrity or a consumer uh, who might be blogging on social media um, or an employee who might um, get onto uh, your own uh, blog or Facebook page and say something, um, really even uh, some great praise about your organization, um, but maybe not reveal that they are an employee um, and so that comment might be misleading. So these guides um, explain when you should be, um, uh, have a policy that explains what, um, what uh, your, uh, your employees should be doing, what bloggers should be doing, what kind of uh, guidance you should be out there about these sorts of things. Um, the FTC revised its endorsements and testimonials guides uh, a few years ago in 2009 to include examples specifically addressing social media. Um, and how organizations should um, conduct themselves in social media. Um, and essentially what it says is that um, bloggers and other social media marketers who have a relationship um, uh, with the company or with a nonprofit um, about which they are blogging must disclose that relationship. Um, so what does that mean? It means that um, you as the organization should have a policy or procedure that explains um, first to your employees, and second um, to anybody to whom you might, uh, say, induce in any way, give something free, um, run a contest, that sort of thing that explains you should be disclosing that you got something from us um, in order to um, say something about us. Positive or negative, you don't necessarily have to say something about us at all. Um, uh, so uh, that's, it doesn't have to be something complicated, um, but there should be something about, um, about what to do and how to conduct oneself as a influencer is the popular term now in social media. Um, so the first thing is we get a lot of clients who come to us who ask us to help them write social media policies um, that explain um, to employees um, how to conduct themselves in social media. Um, so it becomes important to have in there something that explains um, how to act on, on uh, social media. The second thing is that to the extent that you decide to run some sort of fundraising campaign that gives um, people um, freebies, something like that, in order to um, blog about the organization, post to Facebook, that sort of thing, whether it's a sweepstakes or a contest or a free gift or whatever, then there should be something that explains um, gee, if you do post, yes, you should be disclosing that you got this. Um, so it's pretty simple. 
The other, the other fundamental principle that comes out of this is also that um, you can't use comments on social media in a way that you wouldn't um, be able to say something directly. So if you know somebody is saying something um, that is not correct in social media, um, so, uh, you know, my, your, the such and such organization is saving 5,000 children a day with all the great things they do. You can't post that on your web page or on your social media page um, to trumpet to the world all the great things you're doing because you know it's not correct. Um, so you can't use comments in social media from third parties to say something you're not allowed to say on your own. That's just basic um, principles of uh, advertising in a truthful and, and non-deceptive way, but it's true for social media as well. So, actually I think we have to go back one. We're a little bit out of order. Um, sweepstakes, fundraising, raffles. Um, there are special rules for when you're running a raffle um, uh, in, uh, uh, under the law when you're a, a nonprofit. Um, there are also general rules that say you can't gamble, you can't run a lottery. Um, so this is one of those areas where there are rules that are general and then there are rules that are specific to nonprofit organizations and charities. Um, the general rule is that federal law, um, state laws in all 50 states say lotteries are illegal um, with the exception of the state lotto. People say, wait, the states do it, they have a special exception. Um, a lottery has three elements. The awarding of a prize, um, you've always got that. Um, by chance, usually have that, not always, we'll talk about those, um, where the participants have requi been required to submit consideration in order to enter. Usually pay to play um, in a few states, even non-monetary consideration, some sort of significant effort to enter can be illegal. Um, so, uh, then, in many states, um, charitable fundraising games of chance um, may be exempted from the lottery laws. There are very um, strict requirements for those. Um, usually registration, always registration and permitting requirements. Um, so uh, those are, uh, there are a few exceptions sometimes that have to do with very low limits. Crystalline talked about how often those exceptions are very hard to meet. They tend to be about very low dollar limits. Sometimes churches are exempt, that sort of thing. Um, so if you want to run some sort of raffle, which is defined generally as a payment in order to enter, you need to be conscious of the fact that there are these very strict requirements for doing so. Um, and call a lawyer and figure out what they are. Um, one of the most, the other very complicated requirements is that often there's a residency requirement that you have to have been resident um, in um, the state for a certain amount of time. So an example would be Indiana, um, where uh, the requirement under the raffle laws for Indiana is that an organization must have been continuously in residence um, in that state for at least five years or must have been uh, affiliated in, with a parent organization in existence in that state for at least five years. Um, so the, the result of those types of state law requirements is that a nationwide internet raffle is almost impossible to run. Um, the result of this is that you can either um, run a much more localized raffle um, or the um, many organizations now run traditional sweepstakes um, where you truly do have uh, a game of chance where there's no consideration, there's no pay to play requirement. Um, often the way to get around the, um, the, the prohibition on consideration in a sweepstakes is you simply offer a free alternative method of entry. You don't require payment to enter. Um, and a lot of the time, uh, never under, uh, underestimate the power of guilt. Um, with, a, with a charity or a nonprofit, people will often make that donation in order to enter. Um, if you put proper um, restrictions on, uh, the lim on the number of entries that people may have, limit one per the contest or that sort of thing, um, you often can, can have a perfectly reasonable traditional sweepstakes um, where there's a donation uh, uh, method of entry. So,
So um, then we can, and uh, Crystalline actually had helped me with these and put in some sort of the typical raffles, buy a ticket for $5 for a chance to win a car, raise $1,000 or more, you'll be entered for a, ch a chance to win, you know, the traditional, your ticket for the event. So these are the types of raffles. Um, what you're seeing increasingly now, though, are the very popular user-generated content contests. I get a lot of calls about how can I set up um, a voting contest, create a video about how um, such and such is your favorite charity, or how you would raise money for um, your favorite cause, that sort of thing. Um, those uh, have very different rules because what you're doing there is you're eliminating chance from the equation of that three elements, um, prize, chance, consideration, because you no longer have chance in the mix, you can now have consideration. Um, so the, the issues there tend to be, though, that you, ha you raise a lot of um, uh, intellectual property issues. To the extent that you want to post people's entries, or you might actually want to use those entries in the future, you need to think about um, getting proper releases for the intellectual property that people are, are providing in the form of their entries, in the form of those videos, or those essays, or those photos, um, and uh, what types of signed written releases are you going to need to get from your entrance, um, what, type, what third parties might be appearing in the videos or the photos, um, and how are you going to get representations um, from the entrance, um, or the third parties uh, that, that, they have pr that you have proper permission for those people? Um, or how are you going to screen the promotion entries to make sure that there's no obscenity, inappropriate matter appearing in them? Ford ran, um, I believe it was Ford, it may have been Chevy, um, ran a contest a few years ago um, that was supposed to be how people loved their SUVs. Um, it turned into actually what was supposed to be a PR positive turned into a PR negative because people started um, posting entries about how terrible the SUV was for the environment. Um, so, uh, you know, the lesson learned was that you have to be much more careful about uh, screening entries as they come in because you don't want what is supposed to be a positive for your organization to turn out, um, you know, to be an overall negative. These things are supposed to be good for your organization. Um, uh, Melissa, one quick question from the, uh, from the webinar, and then we've we got to move on and cover some other topics. But in terms of the consideration requirement, uh, obviously we're all familiar with um, you know, uh, pay or donate uh, X number of dollars and, and you have a chance to, to win whatever. Um, questioner says, uh, what about if, if, if you're required to complete a survey in order to be entered into the raffle in order to, for a chance to win? Is that considered uh, consideration for, for these purposes? Most states at this point only prohibit monetary consideration. There are a few states where um, non-monetary consideration is an issue. The recommendation tends to be if you want a survey, um, it's better to have a, a short survey that doesn't take a lot of time. Um, a very lengthy survey that takes 15 minutes to respond to um, can raise consideration issues in those states that do prohibit non-monetary consideration. In those states, you can consider either A, eliminating those states, or B, just providing the free alternative method of entry. Um, that always solves the problem. So that's a relatively easy way to get around the problem. Okay. Of course, then you have the issue of people who just don't want to take the survey. Right. So um, that's, that's where the calculus goes. Okay. Um, so uh, that is... Um, the other issues with, with user-generated content contests are um, you need to think about your disclaimers, um, things like DMCA policies and the other types of things you, give, uh, you put on your website to avoid intellectual property infringement issues. Um, and uh, these are all the types of things that go into putting together um, the rules that are required in every state, whether you're running a sweepstakes or a contest. Um, because state law tends to require um, rules that have pretty extensive disclosures, um, which generally, um, whether you come to Venable, hopefully, um, for rules, we, you can get a set of form rules and then sort of mark them up to, um, 
uh, to reflect how you want your contest to run. Um, but those rules will, will um, hopefully fulfill both the state requirements to have things like restrictions on eligibility, um, age, ge geographic restrictions, that sort of thing, and then also the disclaimers on liability, um, intellectual property releases, all that sort of thing that give you the cover in case something goes wrong, which unfortunately can happen. So, um, the other thing to note is that when you run a promotion through social media, um, the social media websites like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and the like have their own rules that apply to prize promotions. Facebook is the most restrictive. Um, they have some very specific guidelines. In particular, you can't run a promotion directly off your main Facebook page. You have to use an application um, or a Canvas page. Um, and there are restrictions on using likes as the voting me mechanism in a voter voting contest. Um, so that's, um, that's something to consider. You also have to um, uh, have specific releases for Facebook. Um, most of these rules for all of, um, all of these websites have to uh, do with, A, releasing the social media site from liability, because as you can imagine, they don't want to be liable for anything that goes wrong with your contest. Um, and then B, uh, avoiding sort of flooding the website um, with entries. Um, so, you know, another example would be um, Twitter and Twitter's guidelines, which discourage uh, creating of multiple accounts or retweeting to win, um, because there were previously issues with uh, these ideas that you um, have retweets to win, which then flooded Twitter's website. Um, and then the idea that you include relevant hashtag topics in your tweet entries um, to make sure that you can recognize who's entering your contest. So very practical requirements. Um, one of the questions we get a lot are how to um, actually include the, the rules disclosures that are required under state law on Twitter because you have so little space. Um, there are ways to do that where um, you essentially link to a, um, a short form disclosure, so it's not impossible. The, the in thing now is Pinterest um, and these pin to win promotions. One went up just this morning um, that actually was um, a, a sort of free product promotion from Elizabeth Arden. Um, so it looks like it's going to be really cool. I encourage you to look it up. Um, but uh, Google Plus is also a new venue for that and has restrictions. Mobile giving is another really popular way of running, um, uh, running promotions. Um, the CTIA, or the Wireless Associations, has um, guidelines for mobile giving. Um, the carriers uh, have their own restrictions for, um, for mobile giving promotions. And whenever you run a promotion, um, using the wi using um, wireless carriers or the like, you actually have to get them approved through um, through the different carriers. So that's something to build in automatically in your timeline for creating a mobile promotion like a sweepstakes or mobile giving or the like. It takes a lot of time, and you have to know their rules. Um, so the CTIA or the Mobile Marketing Association both post the rules on their websites, and you can go to them to check them out if you haven't already been doing that. Um, but there's also, you can get accredited by the BBB's Wise Giving um, anal uh, Alliance. Um, it's something to think about. They're pretty complicated. Um, the most important thing from a legal perspective is the Telephone Consumer Pr Protection Act um, requires prior express consent before you start texting people. Um, there have been a number of very large class action lawsuits with settlements in the millions of millions of dollars, as in seven to $10 million range, for texting people who did not provide their prior express consent. Um, so it's very important. Um, it's a very effective way of advertising to um, text people, um, but it's also very important to follow the rules there. We, we have a, a lot of questions sometimes from smaller charities saying, well, I, this looks so successful, I want to definitely uh, jump into this, this mobile text to give, can I do this? Um, and what you want to consider are the, the carrier requirements have 
certain years, usually they say you have to be in existence for, I think, five years, and you have to have a certain net or gross revenue per year. I think it's around half a million dollars. So it's something to consider uh, for larger organizations, but for smaller organizations, it's sometimes just not a viable option yet, but something to consider. And there are, there are 501c3 groups that actually run the platforms, um, mobile giving, for example, that you can check out their website for, for the more um, information about mobile text to give. And I'm kind of speeding through due to time constraints, but to the extent you have any questions about the specifics of some of these, please feel free to catch me or call me or anything like that. Um, these are often complicated rules, um, and I'm just trying to give you a taste for sometimes the fact that there are rules and, and you know, um, some of the more restrictive ones that can catch people unawares. Um, and, and I should point out before um, we start to lose people that in your handout materials, those of you in the room, you'll see uh, probably more than we've ever done before, quite a number of uh, articles and even a couple uh, white papers from Melissa and Crystal and other colleagues on these topics. So there's a lot more material here in depth on, on all of these topics. Uh, and as I referenced earlier, tomorrow in the email, you'll get, uh, everyone will get a link to all of these materials, including the supplemental articles and white papers. And we have many, many more on our website. Um, if, you, if you go to where we have all of our uh, nonprofit publications housed, you'll see the link at the, on the last slide here. Um, there's a subcategory for, um, for tax. There's a subcategory for social media. And you'll be able to find a lot of the stuff there. The final sort of specific example are auctions and reverse auctions online. These have become really popular in England, which is why you'll notice the example has a euro on it. Um, we get a lot of questions um, that start like, well, they can, they're doing it in England. Why isn't it okay? Or actually British sites that are trying to come over to the U.S. Um, because this sort of, particularly the reverse auction style website um, where you'll uh, sort of bid on, pay for a bid um, on an auction and try to get the lowest possible bid on an item. Um, so I'll say, gee, I'll pay a penny um, for this big screen TV or for a bid on a big screen TV and then try to get the lowest bid when the time is up on the auction and win that for a dollar. Um, these types of auctions have been very popular as opposed to the traditional auction. Um, and it ends up functioning much like a sort of traditional sort of pay-to-play sweepstakes. And really, it's more like a lottery. Um, and so the problem is, A, you need very, very specific rules, and B, there is this issue of whether it's really a lottery. Um, you need to be very careful. The gaming policy in the U.S. Uh, may be relaxing as to what is gaming and what is lottery, um, and there is this general tra trend towards what is the new term gamification in sort of how we play and how we advertise and that sort of thing. Um, so the DOJ had reversed its uh, position on how the U.S. Wire Act applies to online gaming and um, the state, states may start to um, permit what's sort of intrastate, in-state online gaming. Um, so it may be that we start to see more of these sorts of things being allowed, um, but for now, if you get somebody who comes up with this idea, you need to be very careful in vetting it. Um, because uh, it's, it's on the line, is, is how we would say. Um, the, other, the other important thing that's going on in this area is that about 10 years ago, the FTC came out with some guidance called dot-com disclosures um, that was intended to give people who are advertising online an idea of how you could use the Internet and things like hyperlinks and scrolling and the like um, in order to more efficiently make the disclosures that we would always see in the small print in TV ads and in newsprint and the like, and essentially said that in these circumstances, hyperlinks are okay, and two links may not be okay, but one link certainly is, or you can't use white print to, you know, as the hyperlink, but underlining and, and red is okay. Um, well, the FTC is now, 10 years later, finally reexamining those guidelines um, as to what is prominent, um, a prominent disclosure and what is clear and conspicuous online. Um, and looking at things like um, they always said, gee, if you have to scroll down past the initial screen, that may not be a prominent disclosure. 
Um, and they're looking at uh, whether um, disclosing something on the little tiny screen on a phone, whether there may be certain disclosures that just aren't going ever to be clear and conspicuous on that sort of thing. So those could affect um, charitable promotions and charitable solicitations as well, and it's certainly something to watch, um, particularly, I think, in the mobile promotions arena. Um, I think we've got it down online, but that's the area that we're going to see the most change in. And, and just a Carla a comment here. Um, uh, Melissa and Chris and I have been talking about required disclosures, and there's many instances where either because it's expressly required by a federal or state law or simply because it's good practice to help limit liability, that disclosures are, are very important. And of course, the form that the disclosure takes, as Melissa just said, can be important. But there are also instances where you actually need to have the individual's consent to certain terms, their agreement to be bound by certain terms and conditions. Happens all the time. Nonprofits all the time are coming to us with questions about instances where they need to get uh, uh, an individual uh, to, to consent to something, to give uh, permission, to give a release, to give a copyright assignment or license, uh, or whatever the case may be. And just keep in mind um, that the mere disclosure of something and the fact that someone read it doesn't mean that they are agreeing to be bound by those terms. There are many instances where you need to have an individual click and accept that they agree to be bound by those terms, including, for instance, even your own disclosures on your firm's we uh, your, your nonprofit's website. Uh, there have been cases now that have held that um, uh, an individual who is visiting a website is not, doesn't need, is not going to be bound by the terms and conditions on that website unless they were required to click and accept that they agreed to those terms before they entered the website. So keep that in mind as you build in uh, functionality for, for your online promotions and whatnot. Um, second to last slide and then tax from Crystalline. Uh, privacy issues, the FTC has been very active in the area. The states have been very active. There's been some new state laws as well. Um, you continue to have to be very aware of what you're doing and collecting your website users' data. Um, you must adhere to the promises you're making to consumers, to your users, to your, um, the people who are donating to you um, regarding privacy and data protection. Um, you must implement um, reasonable and appropriate measures to protect personal data and disclose if you're using or selling any kind of data. Um, the hot issues here are things like geolocation on phones, um, behavioral advertising and tracking. If you're trying to track across, as people move across the Internet, which is sort of the very cutting edge, um, and really only the very biggest organizations are doing it. And then to the extent, if you have any kind of children's area on your pages and you're collecting any kind of children's data, the FTC has just announced that they are going to, in fact, re-examine their ongoing um, proceeding on, and on the children's, the rules for collecting children's data. Um, they had sort of appeared to have come to some sort of um, position on it, and now they're reopening again um, the children's privacy issues. So this is the hot issue right now. Um, if you are doing anything with um, data um, and, and children, you should be watching this area very carefully. Um, so that's the sort of what comes next when it comes to privacy. Um, and this is another area, actually, the states um, are really stricter even than, um, than the, uh, the feds when it comes to privacy. And there are a number of states um, that have passed new laws, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Hawaii comes to mind. Um, so that's, uh, that's another important area. And then tax to Crystalline. So we've appreciated that you've given us uh, two hours so far. So as a gift, we're going to skip this slide for the yeah. most part. But just to give you the basic idea, um, as a nonprofit, you're exempt from tax on related income. Uh, what's related and unrelated is, is a, something you really need to take a close look at because you are taxed in, in most instances on unrelated income if it doesn't fall into an exception. The exceptions are in the code that you'll want to take a look at. Um, and, and just to, to keep in mind, when you're, whatever income you're receiving, whatever solicitations you're doing or activities you're conducting, it doesn't matter if you're using that income for related purposes. It's how the income that's gener how it's generated that's, uh, for consideration that you need to take a look at to see if that activity holding a spaghetti supper is related to your charitable purpose. And if not, you'll, you'll want to see, it. does it fall into any of the exceptions? Are we reporting it correctly on the Form 990? Or any expenses that we can take against that income? 
in the, um, uh, on this slide the, uh, the points about, for instance, qualified sponsorships. This is the issue of if, if say, as part of some sort of a, a dinner or a golf outing or some other fundraiser, uh, you have companies who are, say, donating some products or services or perhaps just contributing money to help fund the cost of the event, and you're acknowledging them as sponsors, uh, this is really the issue of does the money that you receive from those sponsors have to be treated as taxable unrelated business income to the organization because they're getting some signage and other acknowledgement at the event that looks and smells a lot like advertising, which is typically taxable, or is it simply a contribution where you're giving an acknowledgement to the uh, contributor? And that's basically the dividing line between taxable advertising income and tax-free corporate sponsorship income. There are some, thankfully, very clear specific rules that the, uh, there's a clear statute and, and, and clear IRS regulations uh, in this area. We have, a, uh, I think, a great article on our website that spells all this out if you want more information about it. But it's a huge area in, in and of itself. We could spend half a day talking about this, but something you, you definitely want to take a look at. Um, and of course, uh, the other kind of tax issue that we don't have on the slide that's very important is the, uh, the issue of uh, um, providing an acknowledgement and notice to donors. Uh, when donors uh, make a contribution to your charitable organization, there's a requirement that you provide them with a receipt acknowledging the amount of the contribution and spelling out uh, the value of any goods and services that they received in return. Because assuming they're giving a donation with donative intent, if they get something like a dinner and drinks and entertainment or whatever else in exchange for that contribution or a hat or a T-shirt, uh, their contribution is only tax deductible to them to the extent that their donation exceeds the value of what they get in return. And you as a charity are obligated to provide that written substantiation uh, to the donors. So with that, Kristen, you want to finish up your last hypothetical? And if you can do it in about three minutes, and then we'll sure. wrap up. Um, we can move it ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this is just a, a kind of combination of some hot topics that we've seen recently to take a look at. So this comes across your desk. It's a, from your marketing department, your development department. They think this is what they're going to do, and they're going to do it next month. They're going to have, a, for example, a, a concert promoter and a nonprofit uh, cancer awareness group are going to team up. They're going to hold a concert, and they're going to raise funds for the nonprofit. And they're, they're expecting this is going to be a really great event, big event. They're going to have a giveaway raffle with VIP concert tickets as the prize. They're going to have 5% of the ticket sales to go to the nonprofit, so all the sales or 5% are of that is going to be donated. Um, they're going to have a giveaway, and the 5% donation be advertised on radio, TV, and on the Internet. Um, of course, they want to reach their maximum audience. And during the concert, they're going to have a text-to-give campaign. The um, performer is going to say, okay, now let's whip out your mobile phones and text-to-give. So this is, this is what's going across your desk, and they need it approved in a week. So what are you going to take a look at? Uh, these are the things that you have to turn to. The first part is the charitable raffle registration and disclosure requirements. They're going to have a giveaway drawing for the VIP tickets. That is probably triggering most state raffle requirements. Um, and you'll want to make sure that if you are holding a raffle that you have the proper permutation and that you wait the, the proper amount of time to receive the approvals that are necessary. Um, and also the commercial co-venture law, it's 5% of the sales. That's a product or service and it's going to benefit a charity. So those have to comply with the disclosure and registration requirements for commercial co-ventures under the state charitable solicitation laws. Um, and then you have your text to give campaign, um, your mobile giving. Are you collecting information from the, the mobile giving? How are you going to set that up? Do you meet the carrier requirements? Um, and then general marketing laws. Are you, are you giving the proper disclosures? Are you telling consumers exactly um, what their donation is going to and, and describing the charitable environment correctly? Or are you um, being, being fraudulent in that regard? So those are some things that you'll, you'll want to use your checklist for in, in looking at these sorts of campaigns. And without further ado, do you have any questions for us? Uh, Chris, or? Finish up oh. with your no. last slide. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess we should. So here, here are just some, some closing thoughts. Um, when you're planning your promotions, make sure you, you um, factor in that lead time that you'll need for the different registrations and approvals. Um, consider your target audience when you're conducting these campaigns. Um, you, for example, you, you might want to consider doing commercial co-ventures that are for the same sorts of audience, um, that if it's a, a pet charity, perhaps you want to try to team up with a uh, uh, for-profit entity that sells pet products, so you're really targeting the, the right sort of people. Um, or there's a, a, another side that says if you're, you're for example, um, the Nature Conservancy, the retailer was Macy's. That was a really popular campaign. The causes are, are not really aligned, but they're reaching a really broad audience. Um, so, so that's an, ex an example of the other side. 
Um, assess your fundraising campaign and, and whether it's worthwhile with the compliance burdens. Um, we've seen this sometimes in the commercial co-venture space where it's a new uh, for-profit entity and they're just starting out so they don't really know what their sales is going to be, but they do want to incorporate that charitable aspect. Well, because of the registration requirements and what's, what that's triggering, maybe you want to wait a bit until that for-profit's off the ground. You can really know the sales figures and see if it's even worth the registration fees. You know, it's something to do a cost-benefit analysis of. And then finally, in light of all the, the regulatory and legal requirements, even if you don't particularly trigger any of those, you want to consider the PR damage that could result. Um, it, even if you're not, you know, being, you're being truthful, but it's a little bit, you know, mis misleading or not really congruent with your charitable purposes, consumers will remember this. It, the, the commercial conventions in, in particular are so effective because you can reach such a broad audience. Anybody that walks into the store can see it. But on the other side, if your uh, product fails or it's not such a good match with your mission, that's what the consumer is going to remember about your charity. I think that's a, a broader point, actually. It's not, to spin it in a more positive way, it's sort of a cost-benefit analysis, which is there's a lot of um, regulatory hurdles to jump with these types of campaigns. And um, they, while they can be extraordinarily effective, particularly now with the sort of power of social media be, behind you, um, you also have to sort of construct them in a way that they have the power to be that effective, which is if you make something um, really onerous to enter, if you have a, um, you know, create a video campaign um, that, that you have to jump a lot of hurdles to enter, but the prize just isn't really that attractive, people aren't going to enter. There's a million creative video campaigns out there nowadays. Um, so make sure your prize is worth it. Make sure that the campaign is sufficiently attractive. Um, or else it's not going to be worth the cost to create it. Um, and the fact is that if then there is some sort of um, PR bust, it's really not going to be worth it. That being said, if it, if it takes off, then um, it's going to be huge. So then it can really, the, the possible upside is, is huge too. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa and Crystalline, for a terrific presentation. Uh, do we have any uh, final one or two questions here in the room? I know you were patiently waiting back there. I just wanted to speak to whether there are similar implications if you're working internationally. Yeah, that's, that's an area that we get asked, uh, asked about a lot. And yes, right, the question is, um, are there similar implications if you're doing activities internationally? Um, yes, and, and it's very country by country specific. Um, so if you're running an international campaign, I'm sorry, but the advice I have to give you is to consult an, an attorney to look at the different requirements of the, the various countries because it's just too, too much to sum up in any one statement. I do a lot of global coordination of promotions, and what you end up having to do is, is um, hire local counsel in the countries where you want to run it. Um, because in particular, the sweepstakes and promotions laws vary, um, any of the advertising laws vary country by country. And so you need to, I mean, we do coordinate them globally, but it's a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, and it can be very costly. So you need to take that into account. Any final question? Yeah, right here, last question. No, It's separate. So the question was, uh, any state registration for raffles compared to state registration for charitable solicitation, are those the same or different? Uh, they are very different um, and, and separate and independent. All right, I want to thank our speakers for a terrific presentation. Thank all of, thanks to all of you for uh, coming out and participating here today, and we hope to see you back here next month for our next program. Thank you very much.